I, I don't want to say shock therapy because that, that's not what it was, but they would like dunk them in cold water and that somehow can retain some of the things that you learned. I don't know how good the research is on that, but I was like, man, I should start doing this, like going and jumping <laughs> in my pool after I read. Emotions are really tightly tied to memory. And so getting dunked in a tank of cold water as a kid is going to be tied to a really <laughs> yeah, strong a emotion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hate Maybe my parents. <laughs> it's like Pavlov conditioning, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's the most negative stimulus you could have immediately after learning something. So boom, it's stuck in there. Well, would but, that only but, work for like one chapter and then you'd have to get a new <laughs> yeah. stimulus? The next one you yeah. get shot with a paintball as soon as you yeah, finish yeah. the chapter, but you don't know what's going to happen. And you remember the thing or you remember getting dunked in yeah, the water? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I remember. Yeah. Remember I was supposed to remember something, then I got dunked in a tank of water. Yeah. First it, time I got hit with a paintball was in the neck, right? In no the way. Was so painful. No. And they were like, I was like, you know, I was a kid. I was like, is it going to hurt? And like kind of nervous. And they're like, well, it hurt enough where you don't want it done again, but you're not going to cry. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Start Did crying. You cry? Immediately cry. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were so dumb as kids. We would literally take all our clothes off and make someone run across and we would just shoot them. And then the next person would go. Yeah, like, why do you have to get all their clothes off? It would just hurt worse. <laughs> Wait, I mean, we had their like, clothes off? We had like oh, boxers on. Yeah. But yeah, you take your shirt off. So if it hit you, uh, you got a nice well. stung so bad. <laughs> yeah. I would. So I stupid. think I would still do that. Which, can I do it? Like but the older kids always had like the better. What is it? CO two or whatever the. Thi yeah. And they'd always crank their pressure up too high. And well, speaking of how stupid I am, still <laughs> one of Travis's members is like a world class shooter for Glock, and I was like, how far away would he be able to hit me with a handgun? It was like, if I'm 100 yards away and I'm running, he couldn't hit me. And Travis was like, I bet you he could. And he was like, 100%. I would definitely hit you. Oh, yeah. like, really? Oh, shit. And Can we test I, this with like a yeah. BB? And I said I'd be willing to test it if he had like something that wouldn't kill me. And like not where the stakes were. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm willing for Max, trying to dodge it. Max is willing to stake his life on this. <laughs> There's yeah. no way you could do this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's nice having both of you on. Hey, yeah. Two two big good. minds. <laughs> I could just sit here and listen. Yeah. We are about to announce the launch of our coaching movement course. And so we have the two minds Whoop. behind it, along with our PT on site, Kyle Habdo. A couple others helped along with it. But I think that this is just a good opportunity to talk about what movement is to you guys and how you utilize it in your coaching philosophy. Yeah. I also want to make sure that this is practical for people listening so that it's not just like a pitch for a course. I yeah. think maybe telling the story of... Are, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time and coaching people and how many people in the CrossFit space get hurt on a regular basis or don't know how to balance all Speaking the variables. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I knew, see, I knew I was <laughs> going to suck at this. We need to get a yeah, better yeah, second, yeah. third mic. Yeah. I have the mic that is not on a handle or what yeah. are those things what is called? This thing? An, An arm. arm. Yeah, you gotta and really pay. Attention. I gotta really pay attention to. Okay, it. he's got okay. this. All right, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> Telling stories about movement. Yeah, I mean, I think just I, I'd like to try to make it practical for athletes, and then also just give coaches an understanding of what we put into the course and how we created it, and how it's different from our older iterations. So that way, it's not just like a you know a pitch exactly about the course. Well, the other thing too is it's not just for coaches. Like this has this can help the athlete better understand how to master certain movements in the sport for just performance. Maybe it's like, I don't even care about health and longevity. You should, but yeah. let's say you don't, you just care about performance. You could still use the model that you guys have built and then think about your performance in that way. Yeah, for sure. What would you say though? We target it. To this is, this is built for coaches. Like, for sure. So I, I was actually, bef before we did this podcast, I was writing out some of the, like the welcome email that everyone gets. And I was going through, it's like, well, what do you, what do you get in this course? And it's like, we basically are giving away the systems that we use to look at movement, to assess someone's movement, to actually take a client and, you know, run them through a movement screen and assessment. Like we give you all of that. You know, we go through the process of actually building a template, right? So like the beginning of building a training design, how to actually go from your template to your first training program. Like we actually have gone through and laid out this process and kind of given away our systems that, you know, Max says we've, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been coaching to, you know, not together, but together. If you combine the, the number of years, Max and I have been coaching, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's almost 30 years. So I think probably. I'm approaching 20 years of coaching at this point. Let's start with the question. What is movement? Like how do you guys view movement and then explaining to the athlete, how they could view the coach and the athlete, how they could view movement. Yeah. So I actually, I'll start with how I got introduced to thinking about the concept itself. I, Getting into CrossFit in the earlier days was super hard to get good information, right? Nowadays, if you go on YouTube and you type, 
I want to get a better muscle up or I want to get a better snatch or I want to learn about barbell cycling. There's resources for all of this stuff. When we were first coming up, it was all like figure it out. So I was going into all of these different training disciplines, like going and meeting weightlifters like Glenn Penley and John North and going and meeting people that were involved in the development of gymnastics bodies and trying to figure out like, how do you get better at all this stuff? And all of them were very helpful in some capacity, but they were very segmented. You learn from a weightlifter and you're like, all right, well, does that apply if I'm trying to do 30 as fast as possible at 30% of my one RM? Cause that's what Grace or Isabel is. And no one had any experience doing it. So oh, did you say John North? Yeah, I did. <laughs> what did you, you learn from John? <laughs> uh, I went down and trained with them in Florida, and then I just stayed in touch with both of them, and they helped me write a training program. Did he teach you how to smoke cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> Intensity, <laughs> baby. Yeah. He was Although, awesome. That dude was he, amazing. He, they ran a good seminar because he yeah. brought the energy. He was yeah. fun. He was great. Yeah. He was His videos were awesome back in the day. Yeah. 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 And I think I developed some of my snatch faults by mimicking the way that he snatched <laughs> as well. Yeah. Snatch faults. Yeah. Well, Max a lot says of snatch faults with the 300 pounds. Yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah. Anyways. So back in that time, there was like, there was no information about how to help people who were getting injured on a regular basis that were doing this type of stuff. And I was like, why is this happening? So there was this whole thing, like kind of underground culture of movement by this guy, Ido Portal, and he's little Israeli dance, martial artist, capoeira. And he just started making me think about like, okay, I was thinking movement was this technical joint by joint biomechanical thing. And he started to kind of expand and say, okay, when you're getting into the athletic realms, it's much more complicated and it's hard to like boil down movement to like a lever in your elbow. Because if you're throwing a ball, the elbow's like rotating, the hands rotating, the core has to stabilize. And it was kind of giving me a big picture umbrella to understand all those little things that broke down. So that's kind of how I think about movement itself as a concept. It's what we do every day in the gym. It's what we do outside of the gym. It's our habits. It's technical training. It's understanding if somebody's flexible versus uh, super intense and able to express power. And getting that big picture umbrella has helped me just like coach people and understand when they come in and I do an assessment is like, all right, what does this person like need to work on on a big picture basis? So then you can start to drill down into the details of what needs work after that. So in the course, what we try to do is take Max's kind of big picture, kind of conceptual model of movement and turn it into like a synthesizable, understandable and applicable system. And we came up with what we called, we gave a catchy, a catchy name called the fives model. <laughs> it's catchy for Kyle. <laughs> Corny, Corny Max and Kyle. Yep. Fives. It's super catchy, but it's easy yeah. to remember. And, and basically we, we took all of the, you know, kind of conceptual framework that Max had come up with, came up with and boiled it down to a system that people can use to actually view and think about and analyze movement so that they can turn it into coaching a program design essentially yeah. after that and this i think is is practical for athletes so basically those five things are freedom intensity variability endurance and self-mastery and if you watch somebody move if you just i'll simplify them and say freedom is like your flexibility can you bend over can you get into positions can you just move without major restriction intensity is being strong in a pattern endurance is being able to repeat it on a regular basis variability is being able to do it in a lot of scenarios. So in CrossFit, like squatting is important, but you need to squat with your arms overhead, your arms in front rack, your arms in front rack with the barbell, your dumbbells by your side. Like there's a lot of different patterns of squatting that you need to master. And then self mastery is kind of this overall concept that just like every person has to learn on their own how they move. Some people are big. Some people have long legs. Some people have short legs. Some people have past injuries. Some people are aggressive. Some people are conservative. So I think of self-mastery as something that just kind of develops with your journey. So that model was is something that as coaches, you can start to evaluate people through to say when they come into a, do into a door and you're assessing them and you're trying to figure out how fit are they in terms of their general physical preparedness? What are they good at? How does their body move? That you have a system for analyzing that because there's just so many things in CrossFit. CrossFit has barbell cycling, one rep maxes, strong man, power lifting, and it can be very confusing. I think it is very confusing for beginners. And that's why beginners, instead of 
I don't know, training in a way that develops all of their skills, they get very hyper focused on like one thing at a time. Like, oh, I'm going to work on my snatch because it's like you can easily tie to that instead of thinking like, shit, how do I get better at everything in a systematic way? So that's kind of where the framework in the beginning got developed as I was trying to solve this problem. People were like, oh yeah, help me get good at this sport. And I was like, shit, what is this yeah. sport? So no one, yeah. Going on. yeah. All right, let's, let's take a step back then and let's actually use a movement to kind of guide this process for those yeah. that are listening. So you guys pick the movement, make it easy for yourselves. I mean, snatch probably snatch. would be a good right. one, right? Because yeah. most athletes want to get cool. better at so it. So use me as the example. I come to you, Max, I want to be a... I just want to do CrossFit. I want to be able to do a snatch well, but all the other movements, I want to be able to snatch that 30% yep. fast. I want to be able to snatch heavy. I want to be able to cycle an 80% barbell. I want to be able to do a Metcon, so on and so forth. You take me through the process of how you're evaluating me. Yeah, so through that model, Freedom would be doing some basic movement screens. Can you do an overhead squat? Can you bend over, do a toe touch? We created... Movement screening itself is a huge thing in the market. Sure. So we created a basic framework for people to use that has six movements they start with. And then from there, it expands out. So freedom first would be looking at the movements that are associated with your overhead squat. If you can't do an overhead squat, most likely you can't squat snatch well. Right. And so you have these kind of like checklists of like, okay, this is a red flag. This needs to get developed if that's really the goal. Let's say you pass those tests in that freedom aspect, you move to intensity, and now we start to evaluate your strength profile, your back squat, your overhead squat, your power snatch, your full snatch. And this can start to give you an understanding of, well, what aspects of strength is he good at? Where is he limited? Is he a better puller or a better squatter? And it starts to help you think about not just strength, but how you express the strength within all the variables that help with a snatch. Endurance in CrossFit would probably be picking a couple Metcons, like maybe we'd say Randy is 75 power snatch for time, and Isabel is 30 for time at a little bit heavier of weight. And those have a lot of data on them, so you can pair that data to other people that have done the workout. And then self-mastery is something that happens in the assessment process. Sit down and talk to you. How much have you practiced snatching? What's your background with snatching? How do you think about snatching? What do you wear when you snatch? What are the major cues you're focused on? Have you evaluated yourself doing video? Do you have a coach that helps you with technique? And when I go through all five of those variables, that gives me a much more effective starting point to like... You, you missed one. Which one? Variability. Oh, variability. So Which is like dumbbell squat snatches, dumbbell overhead squats, yeah. you know, more kettlebell met, squat snatches. Met cons that have yeah. had snatches in so, them. Kyle, let, let's break this down one at a time. Let's just say I come to you guys and I can't get into an overhead squat. You know, my, my overhead position is really poor. I can do a regular squat, but I can't hold a barbell overhead. You see that. What's the first step in the process to make sure that you can identify that and then fix the problem? I, I think the very first step there is just going to be a simple movement screen, right? So I, I, I think I would start back with, you know, the basic six movements that, sure. that Max is talking about. So I'd have you do, you know, some, some wall angels or some, you know, seated wall slides and just see, is there a restriction going overhead? You know, start there before you put a barbell in someone's hands. Right. Let's see if there's actual just restriction with no load. And if let's say there's not, right? So now the next the next question is, okay, what happens when we take a barbell and we put it overhead and have you squat? And you know, you might get down to parallel. And then you say, Oh man, I feel like I get stuck. Well, then we start to evaluate, okay, your hips are, you know, ten inches, twelve inches behind your you don't have to measure it, but yeah. you can see very clearly your hips are way behind your feet right? Which is creating a torso angle and making it so it's challenging to hold a barbell over your head because you're basically sure. holding it behind your head, right? So then we start to mess around with things like putting some plates under the heels to see if heel elevation, maybe it's an ankle restriction. Then we can take it back and go and, you know, do a wall dorsiflexion ankle test and see, okay, well, you lack some range of motion in, in, you know, your ankles and, and we need to improve ankle dorsiflexion or let's just put you in lifters and see if it changes, right? So it's like, it's a process where you start with really basic screens and assessments, like Max was saying, you know, the first thing we're going to do is really evaluate your freedom and then move on to the next steps. And, and each time you're just kind of trying to like check boxes and, and eliminate some potential like, okay, well, it's not the shoulders because we just did the wall angel test. Now, is it the ankles? Okay. Now we did an ankle test and you just kind of work your way through that list to kind of get someone to the point where it's like, okay, now we, we know that your limitations are your ankles. And for us to improve this, we're either going to have to spend time you know, with things like loaded stretching and some of the tools that we actually talk about quite a bit in the course on for, for changing movement or 
come up with a workaround like a pair of lifters and, and get you in a better position to put that bar. Do you bump into a lot of people who don't do the movement screen part and then just start assuming they knew what the problem was and then run themselves in circles because they are attacking the wrong thing or maybe that wasn't the full picture? Yeah, I, th I think that the it wasn't the full picture. I think that's the biggest thing. And this is more of like, hey, here's what I believe about education in the fitness space. It hasn't been that good. And with movement, it's been overly simplified and then tried to apply to bigger problems that you're trying to solve. And I think what we're trying to do with all the education and as Kyle was talking, he's explaining a systematic framework for how he thinks about coaching. It's not a step-by-step -step process where you're like, oh, you're lacking three degrees of dorsiflexion. So this is the stretch that you need to do. That's band distracted for two minutes at a time on both sides. And it's going to create the change because that's such an overly simplified way of looking at if this person's trying to land in dorsiflexion at, you know, in an end range position with a bunch of weight overhead at full speed. Now you're talking about, well, what's their dynamic athleticism like? What's their core control like? How well do they express this flexibility when both of their feet are together? And what we try to do is figure out like, we've been doing it for 15 plus years each. So some of these things are more automatic, but if you're trying to start with someone in the beginning, instead of giving a, like a logic tree, like, Hey, start here. If this isn't good, then go here. We tried to give a systematic framework so people can start thinking in, in a better way to address the problems more efficiently. Yeah. How important is it to make sure that you're fixing those movement freedom issues before moving on? Or can you just find quick fixes and allow the athlete well, to move on? Think about it like this. If you have someone who can't get into an overhead squat, what is the point of trying to teach them how to squat snatch? Like you're, you're never going to move past, you know, A to B if you can't complete task A. And so addressing those freedom issues is absolutely critical to moving on. I'm not saying that if you find someone that's like, hey, I have slight restriction in my overhead position and it might not lead to an optimal overhead squat, but they can do the move. I'm not saying just spend all your time correcting that. But if someone has a restriction or some, you know, a freedom restriction that prevents them perf from performing the movement, what's the purpose of trying to move on past that without addressing the underlying restriction? And what I've seen, and this is empirical, I have no scientific study to support it, but I've seen a lot of people get injured by trying to progress too fast in CrossFit. A huge example of it would be people that are limited overhead or can't extend their arms trying to learn how to do bar muscle ups with like a kip where they don't actually kip because their arms are in this kind of bent position, getting torn rotator cuffs, uh, ruptured biceps. So I think I can't say it's a guarantee that if you have good range of motion, you won't get hurt. I can't say it's a guarantee that if you don't have good range of motion that you'll get hurt. But I can say that I've seen way more often that if you have those major restrictions, you're going to get hurt when you're doing ballistic high volume stuff. So it's like, to me, it's always been one of my top priorities as a coach. In, in the course, one of the things we did is we identified some really common red flags in all of the different screens that we put out there. And, you know, we spent some time really talking about what makes a good movement core, good movement program, right? So like when you're actually sitting down to write someone's training, what qualifies that as a good program? And part of that is making sure that you address red flags, right? Not something that's a yellow flag, not something that's like, hey, you know, this is a little off. Your program should absolutely address any red flag that you see. If you take someone through our movement screen, Max talked about, you know, having them do a forward fold and, you know, see, can they touch their hands to the ground, right? It just bend forward and touch their hands to the ground. If you can't do that, that is a definite red flag. And I think there's a lot of people in, in the CrossFit world, in the CrossFit yeah. community that lack that flexibility, but are still deadlifting. And yeah. that is where, or doing high volume toes to bar. It's like, where is that force coming from? If you, yeah. if you're that restricted, you're finding it somewhere. Yeah. Right. What about just like the average day, you know, the, the, the soccer mom that's come into the gym that doesn't want to be competitive. Do those movement screens still matter to, to someone like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the movement screens that we put together are something that you could apply pretty much across the board. And that's really what we tried to do is create a movement screen that was basic enough that it's widely applicable, but also valuable enough that when you're done, you can start to move forward in the programming process and actually like 
okay, this is what I know about the client. Now the next step, you know, there's another step before you actually go to write your, your program. And it's like, I need to observe them moving in whatever sport or task they want to engage in. Yeah. Yeah. And for the lower level, let's say a, a coach that coaches group classes, they're not having the same problems they're trying to solve as us right. for the most part, right? Like you work with somebody at a highest level, you're starting to nitpick little details. They, they don't really have major red flags. It's like, well, how do you get doing this movement 0.10 seconds faster. The way I look at a movement screen at a basic level for somebody that's taking classes is, can they step into your class, do all the things that you're going to be prescribing in that class safely enough and get a training stimulus out of it? So if somebody comes in and they show a major red flags in their shoulders, I think having some sort of a screen up front that says, hey, when we do this stuff in the class, you have to be doing this to develop that skill because otherwise you're going to potentially get injured if you continue down this route or you can do personal training with a coach until you get over this red flag and then jump in the classes which a lot of gyms do i think to improve their yeah. revenue Just, i was going to say it probably keeps retention relatively high yeah you keep people safer and they feel like they're actually making progress every time they go in the gym well and to that point i think the movement screen itself should it's not going to tell you whether or not the person can do all the skills of the sport but it's going to tell you whether or not they're they have the the movement ceiling to be able to sure. learn all the skills in the sport. And I think that's kind of what Max was getting at. It's like, you're, you're not using a movement screen to say, all right, you can do a muscle up, you can do our class. It's you have the shoulder flexion range of motion and you have the, you know, the trunk flexion and extension range of motion to be able to safely learn the skill of doing a muscle up. But it's not necessarily going to say you have these things, therefore you have the skill. Yeah, because you could have no red flags and maybe never get a muscle up <laughs> sure. in your life. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that takes us back to the snatch example The you guys can kind of flesh this out a little bit more, but the two things that I see in the sport, the guy that's really strong that doesn't have the proper range, but can still snatch somehow, like he's yeah. finding those compensations or maybe the athlete that has the movement freedom, like they can get into a perfect squat, they can get their hands all the way overhead, but then you put load in their hands and it's like they collapse. They yeah. don't have the tension that's needed to hold those positions. So let's talk about those two styles of athletes when we're talking about intensity. Yeah. Um, so what, what are we talking about specifically with regards so, to intensity? So let's just say that someone comes in and they, they have the movement freedom. Now, now we're moving on to intensity. Like we're oh, building got a it. structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, at that point, if you pass all of the like requisite, hey, you can do these movements, at that point it becomes training, right? Like those people yeah. have to get stronger. So they go on strength programs and they get core stiffness protocols and they do percentage-based weightlifting and they do back squatting. So a lot of the information that's encaps encapsulated in intensity is its own course in terms of how do you develop strength. Right. And that involves your technique and understanding of each movement and your understanding of how to brace and how to breathe and having a heart that's strong enough to deal with blood pressure changes when you're under load for a long period of time. And, uh, that is, I think the easiest thing to do for that without overcomplicated is for people to just be on structured long-term strength training protocols. In, in the course, we actually have two very different example athletes, right? So we actually use Tracy, who's one of our coaches and she, what she lacks is intensity. Essentially. She's not strong enough. Even now, you know, f after four years of, of individual coaching, she's still building the strength that's necessary to be competitive at a high level in the sport. But we took her through our basic movement screen, plus some, some extra movement screens, and she lacks no freedom anywhere. Like right. there's literally no red flags across the board, but her biggest issue is like you were saying, you know, she gets the bottom of snatch and collapses. And we've spent years now building the strength and tension and, and the ability to generate that tension quickly in the bottom of a, you know, of a squat or a snatch or a clean or whatever it is. And, you know, so that's one example. Our other example is, is Linda who is on the extremely strong end of the spectrum in the sport, but, and, and has competed at yeah, she took 11th last year at Lowlands yeah. and I was actually starting to work with her as a real athlete. And I was like, you know, this would be like, I'll show people my process with an elite athlete. How do I look at what they need to develop? How do I put their training into a framework? That's like, okay, well, this person's already one of the best in the world. What can I do? What do I see? So we broke her down and sorry, I cut you off. No, you're good. It, 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 we took her through a movement screen as well. And you'd be shocked at how many red flags she actually had in her movement screen. Flexibility, couldn't touch her hands to the floor. You know, so we're, we're in no way saying that if someone can't pass a movement screen, 
that they're not going to be capable of being a high level athlete, but it, it, the contrast in their programs is just absolutely, especially given that, that both of them, you know, they're both competitive, you know, they're both quarterfinal and above level athletes, but the, the contrast in what they do in training as a result of the screens that we've put them through is it's kind of shocking yeah. actually. Is there a specific type of athlete you see more often? Like, do you see more Linda's or do you see more Tracy's? Mm. I think at the intermediate slash beginner level, I see more Tracy's at the elite level. I'd say I see more Linda's. I mean, I think half of my coaching with Travis all these years has just been trying to improve the efficiency and economy of the way that he moves in general and also preserve like health. He would get aches and pains and tweaks and we'd look at his movement and we're like, Hey, your shoulder's probably sore because like, look at what's going on here when you're doing this movement. And the best athletes in the world often are the best compensators, right? They'll, Oh, you're in pain. Well, compensate around it and get it done. Like, cause that's the mindset that, that they have. But I think also that mindset eventually can become like your Achilles heel and it could be, okay, well you're dealing with injuries now all the time that you can't even train to be a high level performer. Yeah. It would be cool to see parallel universe Travis where he never worked on that stuff and see if he's oh, just uh, completely wrecked. I mean, be yeah, very, he would be. I remember very seeing retired. a picture of him from like 2012 doing an overhead squat and you just want to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I always overemphasize it and joke around and do it like cave my knees <laughs> Till they touch it's one brutal. another and bend my arm, but he was still moving crazy weights. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Didn't I pull up some of his initial videos for? Yeah, yeah, we pulled up See, some. People of his, might hear that and think, "Well, who cares then?" But I think those are the hella exception to the rule, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't take somebody that's literally. I mean, in the He's top, just hungrier than you won. Exactly, right? <laughs> and more disciplined, right? Yeah, more like disciplined. He, he worked. He worked on that consistent. stuff a lot. Not, not only that, he was moving crazy weights for then, but there was a really long period of time where his snatch numbers were just not competitive because of yeah. his poor movement. It took him what until two or three? Well, probably about three or four years ago yeah. to get his snatch to a competitive level, and that was all, all movement work. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he always had the capacity to snatch 300 yeah. pounds. He, it was just getting in the position. He, power well, snatch it. He touch and go snatched 265. I remember. It, like, maybe a couple months after we first started working together. But he would get into competition and anytime snatch came up, like, when it was at, at that truly max top, top, top weight, you have to hit it right now, his, like, shoulder would buckle under the pressure because he was just not in a good position. And we tried weightlifting coaches and, like, none of that stuff worked. And eventually my kind of path through the movement world was, like, I was just gaining all of these tools to understand, like, oh, how do I apply stretching and assist? People think of stretching, like, oh, I'm just going to go in and stretch and, like, do a couple hamstring stretches. But if you think of it and understand it, like, hey, this is strength training. You can create hypertrophy. You can create improve ranges of motion. You can create better positions to be able to lift. But in order to do that, you got to take it seriously and you got to put a lot of time into doing it. And people don't do that because, I don't know, it's boring or it's not sexy or they, they're not sweating and breathing and feeling the intensity of CrossFit. But sometimes, like, you got to take care of that shit so your intensity ceiling goes up so you can actually train more and get that feeling more. To that point, you know, in the course, we have an email that you wrote to Travis about the importance of doing stretching and improving his overhead positions so that I think this was in relation to his jerk, but literally we, we took an email that you wrote to Travis. That is, is it rude? Your, um, <laughs> yes, bitch. yes, a, a little bit. I did have some. <laughs> yes, a yeah. little bit, but yeah. it, it was, it, I think it was intended to be eye opening for Travis to like show him that if you don't do this shit right now, you will never get to the level that you want to compete at. And I think that speaks to your point that most people, they don't even realize how important it is to actually spend time improving their movement. And it often takes, as a, from a coaching perspective, delivering it to your athlete, a lot of work to convince them that this is an important thing for them to do. Because they, I don't think they even recognize that like they have a performance ceiling that they're butting up against because of their movement. And it re- that's, I, I think that's a really important aspect that we actually touch on is the psychology of getting people to buy into changing their movement and coaching it. And like you look at the best, I think the reason why it's perpetuated that people don't work at it is the best in the world move and do what they do almost effortlessly. Talk to a lot of them and like Froning has literally said it. 
now that he never really spent time isolating muscles or certain things, but I think everyone in the community would say that he was one of the most efficient movers at all of the different things out there. So it can create this perception like, well, it doesn't matter because the best in the world doesn't have to do it. And it's like, well, yeah, the best in the world is going to have to focus on different things. And if you're not one of the best in the world, you have to get to the point that your economy of motion is so good that you're not spending as much energy doing all these tasks or you can hit them under pressure all the time. So we get this kind of false narrative that goes out where people are aspiring to be the best thinking that they have to do the same thing as they're doing. And it kind of catch puts them in this weird trap of it's like, okay, well just because they don't need to do it doesn't mean that it's not a major focus. And because they're not doing it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be necessarily. Cause he's even said, uh, maybe I should have spent a little bit more time doing this, but we'll never really know. Cause he's already won 10 titles. Yeah. So like, it doesn't really matter. It'll just be like, well, how's his body feel at that point? Well, that's one of the things I've heard from higher level athletes. They're like, Hey, I'm, I'm close to the season, 10 weeks out. I know I need to fix this thing, but really it's just about performance for me right now. Like yeah. how do you talk to that athlete? Yeah. It, that one's interesting because there are certain times I almost like don't want to say this publicly, but there <laughs> are certain times you just got to ignore the pain and like, and work around it. if you want to be a high level athlete. You like now what kind of pain are we talking here? We're talking just like, I don't know, discomfort. Let's, let's say something less than a seven out of 10 pain. Like there's this, there's this whole part of culture. I actually, there's something in the course. I said, no pains, no gains, because there's like the no pain, no gain movement where you're just like any pain is like David Goggins would be in that yeah. example. It's like, oh, it hurts. Well, fuck it. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. He can barely Your run broken. Now. Go run. <laughs> this is, that's one side. And the other is like pain free movement, which is generally perpetuated by PTs. Like don't take any risk. Never. If you're in pain, scale the motion away. Now, if you take the first, there's a possibility you become a badass athlete if you don't break yourself. If you take the second and you never take training risks, you'll never go anywhere in terms of top level performance. The best performers are dealing with aches and pains or nags or muscle strains almost all the time. So you got to kind of understand like what pain makes sense to push through and what pain is like, Oh, this is sketchy. I need to back off. And this isn't the time of the year to push. So if we're that close to the season, I don't know. I, it, that one's a harder one. You got to be on like a case by case basis with someone like, Hey, how much is this really important for you? Are you a professional athlete versus recreational? And then you kind of make a, a judgment call, which is why I think it's important that we taught these systematic ways of thinking. So people cannot, uh, or so they can be in those situations and just make the best educated right. guess. I mean, as a coach, you really do have to have a good understanding of pain and part of your role as a coach is to educate or help to educate, I think would probably be a better way to put it, your clients to, to understand the different kinds of pain. There's I'll give you a simple example. Like if you, if you were to go out there right now and do Fran, you would be experiencing metabolic pain, psychological pain from the near failure, probably, probably inflammatory pain in your knees. Right. I mean, it may have, you know, neurologic pain in your back from, you know, if Max has broken his back and, and has <laughs> previous back injury, I mean, the, the number of pain signals that you'll be re receiving is massive. And I think it's important as coaches to help you. We're not in, it's not within our scope of practice for me to say like, Oh, I'm going to diagnose your back pain as, as X, but sure. it is within my scope of practice to say, Hey, you need to, to learn to recognize the pain signals that are potentially harmful for you and the pain signals that are things that you need to push through if you're serious about becoming an elite athlete. And metabolic pain is probably the best example of that, you know, like the kind of feeling that you have when you're sprinting on a bike, that is a kind of pain that you don't just need to be familiar with, but learn to embrace in a, in a painful sport like CrossFit. Yeah. You almost have to get better at liking it over time and accepting that no matter what it gets more painful that's a hard thing to reconcile yeah. you're like oh i'm going to keep doing this thing and it's not going to be as bad and you're like well really as you get better it's going to be worse, <laughs> it gets worse, right? worse. <laughs> but you also learn how to deal with it better yes and better. exactly so so mentally i think it's better it's easier to overcome at that point yeah, what's that quote it doesn't hurt less it, it just you just go faster or something. <laughs> you, get, you get better yeah, at dealing you just get, with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what about in the off season though? The, the same athlete is dealing with some shoulder pain. You, know, you talk about Travis. He's had a lot of that yeah. or had some knee pain last year. 
and he still wants to make the games. He still has other goals in his off season, but at the same time, you have to make sure that you're taking care of his body. Yeah. Like, wh- how do you balance getting someone better, like making sure they continue to get stronger or more enduring or, or create more variability, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also take care of the pains that they have? Yeah, I think it's about, to me, it would be kind of periodization, fluctuating and knowing okay, you can't have, like in a car, you can't be in top gear redlined the entire time of a race. It's the same thing in in a training life cycle. If you say, okay, for 10 years, there's going to be times in your career where you're like training all the time and pushing and pushing your limits and sore and like going to sleep every night, wanting to sleep an extra two hours because you're just literally pushing. But then there's periods of time where you need to be like, chilling or saying, you know what? My three most important things that I need to work on are my snatch, my muscle ups and my double unders. So I'm going to create three progressions for those. I'm going to lower my volume a lot. I'm going to do more mobility work. I'm going to do some easy training and have a proper off season, maybe gain five pounds of body fat. So you know that you're overfed for a period of time and then you cycle back into it. And to me, that's a way of thinking. It's a way of operating. It used to be like, I would say that people be like, oh, you're overthinking, go hard all the time, three on, one off, two on, one off. Thankfully, Frazier came out and basically said he took months off afterwards and started to like validate, hey, this is no different than any high level sport. If you're going to participate in on it, you need to be able to understand when to have off seasons, when to take care of yourself, what you need, when like some people throughout the course of a season will get to the point that they're actually unhealthy. Like if you do blood work right after a competitive season, people could be like have breathing dysfunctions or blood work. That's all whacked off. Creatine kinase levels the day after competition. (laughs) I I caught my, that I said whacked off and then Chris laughed. I'm here for Chris. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I laughed in my head before he laughed. (laughs) We have shit. Plenty of those bloopers in the, uh, Oh yeah. In the movement course. Yeah, We tried to keep a little bit more. Lots of whacking off. (laughs) (laughs) Don't don't watch it. (laughs) That would be the sales pitch for the course. Let's talk. Title the YouTube video. <laughs> only fans only. Yeah, I was gonna say it's Max's <laughs> only fans. <laughs> Uh, I do have a couple fans that have asked me for, to join it. Only fans. Well, I oh think gosh. all of us, all of us have heard the the shoe story. Yeah. Mm. Wait, what? No, no, no. That's yeah. not another <laughs> time. You yeah. know, th- this is going back to the actual topic at hand. <laughs> uh, we uh, made Brandon <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> it is a little off topic, but it's something that I, that I have been concerned with now looking at the season structure. You think about the games athletes that went from the games and there was like, what, a five-week turnaround before Rogue or six weeks? Yeah. That's just It's just really hard for them to be able to take some time off and then ramp back up. And then other offs at Dubai, then now Wadapalooza. There are so many things going on that, if you want to be a high level athlete, you have to do those things. I think just for exposure, yeah. a- unless you are and Tia money, Tumi, a- right? and money. They exactly. make, that's how they make their living. So that I think is going to be a coach's, the coach has to guard well from them over training throughout the year. But at the same time, it's like, well, coach, I have to make my money. I know it's a, it's honestly, and it's a nightmare that you don't know what the programming is going to look like. Cause <laughs> like true too. rogue in last year, it really wasn't that stressful in terms of looking at it in comparison to the CrossFit games. When you look at it this year, they let, even just like the first event by itself, like, okay, you're starting with a long uphill trail run loaded rucking and then going into nine other workouts that were really hard. It was like, all right, well, you just did basically another CrossFit Games with the 20 best people in the world. (laughs) Right. I don't think that... I don't think there are many people that will ever sustain doing that. It seemed like the older generation of the greats, basically, they would do the game season, and then they might do one other... Like, I don't remember Froning being at Wadapalooza or anything really in the off season. It right? wasn't he until the, until he was team that he started to do yeah, some yeah. of the he more did team stuff. series, I think. And Frazier, he went to a couple of the big money ones, but he didn't really do a lot. And yeah. th- now Dubai. I think, yeah, only the young athletes will be able to sustain that. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be a case for someone to just totally skip the games and just start being like the the head dog at these other things? I actually I had a conversation with someone who shall remain nameless that I said recommended to that that just based on where they were in the season and what they wanted to do i was like hey it might make sense to like sit the season out and then peak because if you if you sit the season out you have like six months of training until road qualifiers so you could like get really good while other people are competing and maybe losing fitness and and peak to start going on an off season run and and kind of switch the season up but so here's a question sorry this is a little off topic but it'll, it'll be fun i hope 
do you think whoever, let's take the 10th place uh, girl, or it was Alexis. She got 10th at Rogue, yeah. or at, at the games. Yeah. Do you think if she had sat out the games and sat out that whole, if her season ahead of time, she knew she wasn't going to do the game, she was going to skip it, and then her priorities was going to be Rogue, then individual Wadapalooza? Let's just talk about Rogue, though. Yeah. Do you think she could have gone to Rogue and won? Well, Alexis is Does it diff- make up that big of a difference? Yeah, is my so question. I would say this year, no, because for Alexis, I think a lot of it was that this was her first games experience and first time yeah. building confidence that she can compete with the best. But let's say like three years from sure. now, yeah, that's if more it was Alexis in three years, I think that she would perform a lot better. The challenge, though, still is you're not getting exposure at the games, which means you know yeah. you're getting less contracts with these companies yeah, but or whatever. That's, else. I guess that's the question. If then you can go dominate the other thing, and yeah. then you get all that attention. Yeah, sure. I if you w- if you win stuff in the off, I, that's what you'd have to win. I think winning solves any. <laughs> oh, yes, it's like yes. if you show up and start winning things, everyone's gonna. Yeah, know you can't that. skip the games and then yeah, go get <laughs> and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I've been dead last. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, let's move into variability because this is, I think, my favorite one just because of the nature of the sport of CrossFit. But yeah. it also plays into all the other sports that, you know, we, people that we work with or if those that maybe are interested in, like pickleball is huge now. Yeah. But there's so much variability even in that and how you rotate and what you do with your wrist, with your paddle. And yeah. I know that may be a silly example for some people, but there, there are always things that are kind of outside the box with the way that we move as humans. So how do you incorporate that into a training program and what are you assessing there? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that I would say is that this is probably the variable that most CrossFit programs just do well. Some of them are like, Hey, it's always a weightlifting program. So they're always snatching, cleaning, jerking with a barbell and they're only doing 10 or 15 movements. And that's all they ever do in different formats. But for the most part, a lot of CrossFit programs do have variants because constantly varied functional movements. It's like, it's in their tenants. It's in their DNA. What becomes difficult is when a beginner athlete is trying to get variability and they can't yet do a skill even at a moderate capability. If you put a barbell snatch, a dumbbell snatch, or all of this stuff into their training in in Metcons as opposed to in the development of skill of that thing, they're not really able to get much out of the Metcon because they're like basically doing skill work and it's slowing them down because they're so inefficient. So for a beginner level athlete, it's figuring out and identifying, well, what things are the top priority to work on? So for them, a squat snatch with a barbell and a squat snatch with a dumbbell are probably the two biggest, most important, highest range of motion squat patterns that they need to cultivate because it comes out in the open and quarterfinals and lower level things like all the time. It's one of the CrossFit sexy movements. For an elite athlete, This is where it starts to get into like sport analysis. It's like there are a lot of people that can snatch 285, but how well do you snatch 225 if you're doing muscle ups or if you have to snatch 135 pounds 50 times in a workout and pair it with legless rope climbs? Do you blow up worse than other people when it's like two grip things back and forth? And this is almost like an intuitive, intuitive, deeper sport analysis. Now, not all of that information is covered in the coaching movement course, because that's also like coaching the sport and understanding strength. And like, this is, this is the first of our five course series of starting to create a certification that people can become TTT coaches. And this was like, okay, well, the first thing you have to do if you're coaching is understand how people move. Like we are fitness instructors in a lot of ways and our sport is training. So if you can't do that, like you don't have you don't have the first step of the ladder done. Um, I know I went off on a tangent there, but hopefully I answered how I think about how variability wraps up into the equation. You have something well, to add to I, that? I think the only other thing that I would add to that is, you know, that's variability within CrossFit, but there's also variability within just training in general. And I think of variability in, in my coaching as a tool for combating overuse injury, right? So like, Let's say we have someone who does need to get better at a barbell snatch. Is it someone like Tracy, who we have barbell snatching twice a week, sometimes three times a week, every week for months at a time. So I have come up with a deload schedule for her where every fourth week we don't do any barbell snatching. We do dumbbell squat snatching. We do double kettlebell snatch. We in- introduce variability into the movement. The same could be done for a runner, right? So someone spends a lot of time running on the road, right? It's a ton of impact ground contacts or just, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of ground contacts. One of our tools could simply be have them do a trail run, 
you know, once a week, take some of that, that, you know, road running volume away and put them on trails or put them on a soft surface, like a turf field or take them and have them do, you know, what running in the water in, in chest deep water, which reduces some of the impact and also changes the way that the muscles are recruited because the water provides, you know, 360 degrees of resistance. So thinking of ways to introduce variability into people's training that still moves them towards their goal but also can help combat some of the overuse injury problems that come up. So there's variability from a performance perspective, yeah. which is like 225 snatches and muscle ups combined. And then there's variability from a longevity perspective, which is changing the stimulus so that the body's learning to recruit muscles in new ways and, and, you know, reducing some of the repetitive impact that you might have. I just had this thought as he was talking, movement work to me is like the basics of like nutrition or saving money and budgeting. It sucks to do on a like day to day basis. People don't like to, you know, you see a brownie, you want to eat it, or you see something you really <laughs> like, you want to buy it, right? Like those are the you, those are your natural impulses. Your natural impulses are to train. If you like CrossFit, it's to go hard and push and compete and be with your buddies or whatever it is. If it's martial arts, you might want to be sparring on a regular basis. If it's a basketball, you might want to play pickup basketball. The effects of making those choices of not doing it on a day-to-day -day basis are not really visible on a short-term basis. But when you look at somebody over the course of five, 10 years, it's like, all right, well, you should have been doing it. Like this is, you're basically investing in your own body and recovery process so you can continue to handle do th doing the things that you like doing, but it's just not made a major priority for people. I just, that was like, that was a rant, but it popped up in my head as he was talking about that. I was like, man, this is like the exact basic principles that people don't want to follow. And he was going through his systems thinking of how he basically tries to keep people injury free. You wouldn't notice that that's a good program in somebody, but over the course of five years, if they're getting injured less and they're still able to train, they keep getting better. Yeah. So it's like a hidden hard thing to say like this makes you a much better coach but it right. really does yeah so variability could be used for skill acquisition for performance and for protecting the person for health and longevity yeah right uh what about endurance like that's this, so this will be that like fourth pillar i think this is probably what most people are interested in in the sport of crossfit or really any endurance type sport because they're thinking about how can i you know move up the leaderboard how can i go faster on my snatches or my squats so how do you guys frame this we didn't just think about endurance as cardiovascular endurance, as like your ability to express your endurance on an erg or running. We also think about endurance of like your, your grip endurance, your ability yeah. to tolerate the number of repetitions that are required to learn a new skill, right? So we, we think about endurance as, as a really broad category that encompasses everything from like joint endurance, your ability to just hold a barbell overhead for long enough to do enough overhead squats to learn the skill all the way to, you know, your cardiovascular endurance, your ability to run a marathon or a half marathon. Sure. Right. So, yeah. so it's a really broad category. And we tried to paint that picture, I think in the course that endurance is a huge category, not just something that is captured by these simple VO two max or, or, you know, lactate threshold metrics. It's way more encompassing than that. And we also like practical to CrossFit. We said, okay, here's where intermediate athletes are finishing in the open. Here's how many reps. Like we took all the data that we've used for a lot of different things and share like, okay, well on a weekly basis, this is the type of volume that somebody needs to be able to do of all the skills in their training. And if they can't do that, and then it comes out, the expectation that they're going to be able to handle those reps and do it at speed is very low. And we did that with intermediate athletes and then advanced athletes as well. So that way people can understand as they're building training programs for the sport, how hard and how much volume do you need relative to the athletic level? So that way there's like practical takeaways for people that they're not just like making up workouts at random. Yeah. Kyle, you talked about this and I think that you did a good job fleshing this out. But one of the things I always hear is I need to go harder. I need to feel like my heart is beating faster or I'm breathing really hard, but they're not thinking about the specific bottleneck that may be in a workout. And this is CrossFit specific, but you talked about grip endurance. Another good one would be like shoulder endurance. People mm -hmm. blow up on a strict handstand push up, but they keep saying, well, I just need to do more engine work, but that may not be the case if they're blowing up in strict handstand push ups. Well, yeah, I think a, a really simple way to dispel that would be to put a heart rate monitor on someone while they're doing a Metcon that has in the middle, just imagine this Metcon 50 calories echo, 50 strict handstand push-ups, 50 calories echo, strap a heart rate monitor on them. In the middle of that 
50 strict handstand pushups, if shoulder endurance is a bottleneck, their heart rate is going to drop close to, I'm not going to say resting, but close to 100 to 120 beats per minute. It's going to drop from, you know, maybe you know, 90% of their max down to like 65 or 60% of their max. That right there tells you that their cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory endurance is not the limiting factor. It's clearly a local limitation. And we don't necessarily go into that in depth in this course. That's really for, you know, I, I think more of our, you know, conditioning, our coaching sure. conditioning course that, that we're going to be putting together. Um, but that, I think that shows you very clearly, like, this is not a heart issue. It's not a breathing issue. It's very clearly a local muscular endurance issue. And you can prove that to yourself. Go out there. If you know, if you've got your whoop strap, go do that workout, right? Attack it, go get after the echo bike, do it for time and watch your heart rate drop while you're resting, doing sets of two yeah. or this one. Is assuming you can't do like 50. Uh, somebody's <laughs> yeah, going to be like, like, I I said, said, I'm I'm right now. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, if handstand pushups are a bottleneck for well, someone yeah. like me. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I would take that back to oftentimes the bottleneck isn't even like it, it's, it's not the movement, but it's the positions to be able to get into the movement. So they yeah. can't express the strict handstand yeah. pushup because they have a bad overhead position. So it goes all the way back to freedom and intensity. And yeah. I think it, that's what's so great about this is like, it's almost like this circular thing. That's like, it's always just going in the same circle over and over yeah. again to kind of define what you need to get better at. Yeah. And my Travis started this and he says that every off season, he feels like he goes back to on ramp. And that is kind of what I'm thinking is that you're always circling back to the most basic things. Like the best people in the world at every sport, just do the most simple things at the highest level. That concept was called virtuosity and the way that CrossFit started teaching it. They said doing the common uncommonly well. And I think that's what ends up happening to people when they're doing CrossFit based stuff all the time. You don't realize like, okay, well, two or three years into it, your snatch started to change a little bit, or yeah. you're, you start getting a little too tight or, you know, you're, you're turning up your muscle, muscle ups and you're asymmetrical and you're landing higher on one arm than the other arm. So identifying those things and calming it back down and going back to the basics of freedom and basic strength work is I think always a good idea. It should always be the base of any pr training program. Well, you mentioned that, that uh, about periodization. And I think there's something to be said that the tools that we present in the movement course, in my mind are like your off season, your, they're primarily off season tools, right? They're things that we use to help change people's movement in the off season. If they're an athlete, right? If you're working with someone who's, you know, just a, general population, you know, like, like you said, like a soccer mom, then those might be tools that you use all year. And like this is like the bulk of the program, right? Yes. And, yeah. and during the off season, it is the bulk of the program. Yeah. And even during deloads, I think that the tools that we present are, they're my primary tools that I use during a deload, things like breathing, things like flow, things like, you know, stretching and, and various mobility tools. Those are what we use when we're trying to bring someone back to a state of optimal movement and optimal health they're not necessarily the tools that I'm using the most when I'm trying to improve people's endurance or intensity, but they're definitely a part of the program. Even when people are, you know, even when I have people in heavy strength cycles, they're still using breathing tools to ramp down their nervous system. They're still using mobility tools after training to make sure that they're not getting too tight and they're actually starting to reduce some tension after the session so they can recover and, and get ready for the next one so that they can hit that next really high intensity session the next day because that's what's required to be a competitive athlete. Yeah, you're still utilizing all the tools in the toolbox. You're not just throwing them out and getting them dusty. Yeah, they just become <laughs> less important for sure than, than the off season. All right, so let's go to my. I said my favorite one was uh, <laughs> variability, <laughs> but this one's my favorite because I've mastered the the, the game golf, of golf swing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was just thinking my golf clubs are dusty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm so I self mastery of the golf swing. Um, that is kind of like to to circle all the way to to finish that circle we were yeah. talking about is self mastery and. I don't know if that's ever possible, but I think the pursuit of self-mastery is something that we should all be pursuing in every aspect of, of at least the things that we are our hobbies or we enjoy doing. And so how do you guys define that? And like, give me an example, maybe of like of Travis or one of your high level athletes or what, what they I, are doing for that. I have a really good example of Max. Every day when we would go to film the course, he has a golf club sitting outside <laughs> of where we were filming and it's a left-handed golf club. Yes. And he is doing left-handed swings between every every filming session. He but that out. might be opposite of self-mastery. <laughs> <laughs> he's just screwing his swing yeah, up. Yeah. The, the, the point is that he's, he's doing things. He, he's training in a way that's mindful, right? You wouldn't purposefully buy a, re, a reverse club, a club that's the opposite of your, of your dominant hand, 
if you didn't have intention of spending time thinking about the way that you're moving. Yeah. That's self-mastery encapsulated. And what, part of the reason that I think Max is good to teach self-mastery because he's so intentional in the way that he thinks about coaching other people, his own movement, his own training. That's why I think, you know, anything you hear from him about self-mastery is going to be that there's been some thought put into it. That made me uncomfortable. That was a, <laughs> that was a very nice uh, way to explain it. So I appreciate that. Uh, to give you a practical example, Noah was really bad at deadlifting when we first started working together. He, in 2013, was, I think, in the lead of the Southeast semi or regional and the 21. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Name changes. Yeah. It's the same, same thing. Same that thing semifinal. that qualifies you for the CrossFit Games. It was 21 15, 9 deadlift at 315 high box jump, I think. Yeah. And it took him from first out of qualifying. And the year before, it was something relatively heavy, and he had hurt himself before deadlifting. So we went through a training phase of what, how do you think about deadlifting? And like, there's not much to it, right? He would, in the beginning, he would just go up, get into his hands on there. He had no idea about technique, how to brace, how to create a neutral spine for a one rep max deadlift pull versus all the technique work he did with Olympic lifting. So he created a very intentional process and I created a training program that ultimately led him in the 2020 year. I think he PR'd his deadlift at 545, which kept him in the CrossFit total. And he's not a huge man and he's yeah not really built well for deadlifting with his limb proportions. Like it's not like his legs go all the way up to, you know, his sternum and he's you meant like tall. Yeah. Yeah. I meant long legs. <laughs> I think the long, audience is like, yeah, wait yeah. a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I meant like he didn't have optimal proportions for deadlifting. Sure. And that process is an aspect of coaching movement that is integration of a training program and conversation set up cues. How do you think about it? Some people are very like Brent Fikowski is very professor oriented and technical. And then you hear Justin Medeiros talk. I don't know if he isn't, but it seems he's a very simplistic, like go fast, work hard, like, and both mindsets work to create elite performance. But if you asked Brent to try to think about it, like Justin, it would probably set him up for failure. And if you asked Justin to complicate it and think like Brent, it would probably set him up for failure. So self mastery is really about understanding yourself and as a coach, it's about actually connecting with people to understand who they are, how they think, wh like what's holding them back, what do they need to learn about the way that they move to be more efficient. So I, I thought it was an important thing to put in the model because coaching is not often taught in training education. Like you go through exercise science as an undergrad and you never coach anyone. I'm like, well, that's weird. Like, isn't this what we're supposed to do with exercise information is train people. So that was kind of my way of integrating. Okay. Here's how you would actually coach somebody to be a better mover and think about it as something that's progressible. Very hard to measure though. Yeah. What about, or I guess a better way to ask that is how important is it for the athlete to take ownership of this part in the process? It I mean, is their burden, I yeah. think. It yeah, is it's like the thing. It's called self mastery for a reason. It's not something that where where I can give I can give you the tools. I can show you a path towards self mastery, but it's likely the path that I walked towards my own right. You know, self mastery. It's not going to be this. You're never going to need the same set of tools that I did to to create your own self mastery. So I think it's something that requires self exploration and you know time and and experience in the sport. It's not. It's also not the most important thing for someone who's just getting into training to focus on self mastery, right? I think those are things that you start to focus on when you do get to the level that you know you were talking about Noah and and mastering the deadlift there were a lot of other skills that he had to spend time learning before he got to that stage. And that was the right time to start building self mastery in a process for improving his deadlift. And I think that's really important for people that are listening to keep in mind is like, don't ignore self mastery, but also if you're still in like a skill acquisition phase may not be the most important thing for you. To yeah. The self mastery at that stage of the game is your nutrition, getting enough sleep, doing all like basic habitual stress management stuff. Like at the end of the day, most people don't succeed in physical disciplines because they can't recover from the work that's required. Right. It just beats them up. They get tired. They get burned out. They want to do things that are more fun and don't want the challenge anymore. And oftentimes that can be remedied by just eating right and sleeping and not getting stressed out and taking deloads when you need to and just staying consistent for years at a time.
So let's take this back, pull back a little <laughs> bit since, you know, I know you guys didn't want this to be a pitch for the course, but what do you guys want the coach or the athlete that purchases a course to get out of it? Like, what are you guys trying to offer them and then maybe give them a little background as to kind of how you guys put it all together? Systems. Yeah. We, I want to give people practical systems to get start the process of coaching clients and, and coaching clients better. I think, you know, we've, we've had the opportunity to work with a lot of coaches over the last 10, 15 years. And I think one of the things that I often find is that they always have good intentions, but they don't necessarily have good systems. And without good systems, the, you might have good results with one athlete or a handful of athletes, but it's not going to be consistent. Dang, that should be on the sales page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are, that we good. Are we reminder, recording? Reminder. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, yeah. that, that's the, my good intentions, no system. Yeah. It has always been my biggest problem. I will purchase courses and I will get a lot of good information, but not systems to apply that information. And then, so I'm having to like, I'm struggling trying to figure out how to create systems for myself to apply that for my athletes. Yeah. I mean, I'll jump onto that because the education first, the first thing that me and Kyle ever did was in 2013 in my basement, we just made courses. We made a strength, a conditioning. <laughs> so a nice white background. Yeah, it was, yeah, talking. we were wearing polos that we got made fun of. <laughs> I still bad, had, I still bad. have the polos. Yeah. It, it wasn't our best work, but it was our best work at the time. Yeah. And then as I started to get more information, we're like, all right, well, some of this stuff is outdated. Some people of the stuff, those though, right? Yeah. And yeah. they, they still do well and they yeah. still give people good information, but I mean, 10 years of working with people, my understanding of how to do this well is different. And a lot of the information that I think I was teaching back then, I was parroting from educational sources and literature and other coaches that have taught me things. Now I have this experience base that is like, okay, well, I know what works and what hasn't worked. And I kind of have reasons of why those things worked and what types of people they worked on. So I created a movement course in 2019 and it was, I think it was 18 hours of content. It was just me speaking against the camera. It, it, it didn't really have a manual associated with it. And it was so hard to digest because it was so information heavy. I wanted to teach everything about pain science and I like all of the information that I had gathered, I wanted to share. And it took me a while to realize like, man, my skill as an educator has to get better. And what's the most important thing a coach needs? It's not information. It's an ability to actually do the craft. It's the ability to actually coach. And I wanted to grow TTT and get new coaches. So I started a mentorship program. The mentorship program taught me that I could spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with people, but then there's all this information that I needed to give them and all of them needed the same information. So it didn't make sense to spend my time one-on-one. -on -one. So I created a second mentorship program that was kind of all course materials and didn't have the ability to connect. So this was really our project to grow training think tank. We have great coaches, but the most difficult thing for us to do to grow is to get coaches that we trust, that we understand the way that they think, they understand the way we think, we have the same language. So this course is the first in us giving all of our information in terms of coaching in a systematic framework. Now, you might do things a little bit differently than me. I do things a little bit differently than Kyle, but there are some themes to how TTT coaches should operate, kind of like an ethos, a framework, a way of thinking. And that's really what this whole course project is all about, is teaching that, starting with what I perceive as the most fundamental, which is I, I coach through the lens of movement, and I think of all of us as kind of movement coaches in some capacity. Most CrossFit coaches are just teaching the CrossFit aspect of movement, but I think the course opens up their their scope of practice wider and will make them more effective at coaching CrossFitters by understanding that broader realm of movement. So less, less information, less talking. It's hopefully more fun. The videos are more well-produced. We have a whiteboard behind that I actually wrote stuff that organized my thoughts. They created a manual beside it that was uh, 150, 180, 100, 189 <laughs> pages. That's almost written like a book that ties back to the course concepts. We created assessments for it. So, I mean, we really tried to do everything in our power to make sure that it is one of the best educational sources that people could get if they were coaches. So that was kind of what I was trying to get out of it when we created it. 
Yeah. I got nothing to add to that. I would say <laughs> you, you said less information. There's a ton of information, but it's applied in correct systems. Yeah. So yeah. For those that, yeah. that and, get it. And less than my older, younger, <laughs> yeah. verbose self. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I thought I had to get everything out and I realized like, okay, it's let's, hard to do that. Let's get as little out as is needed to be a great starting point for coaches to get right. better. L let's finish there because you talked about this being a starting point. So what's next? I, the the excitement that I have to learn from the two of you is obviously overwhelming. And I think more people will get there. <laughs> he looks very overwhelmed. <laughs> no, I'm saying like I went through the, you know, Kyle sent me the movement course and I started to go through it. I'm like, man, this is, this is really good information. A lot of it we've been talking about for yeah. a long time, but it's still such a good reminder of like, these are good systems to put in place and make sure that I'm taking care of all my athletes, but there are other ones coming. Yeah. That would, that would be the point. Of that. Yeah, so yeah. What else do you guys have on the docket? So movement, strength, conditioning, CrossFit, Programming. We'll call, Pro, it, call, we'll call it, it program design. Yeah, program design. We don't have the specific name dialed in yet. We know coaching movements this first one, but our goal with that one is more program design for how do you integrate snatch, muscle up, to understand the technique of all the different things because that, like each one of those things needs to be drilled out. Yeah. Those are the base four. And then the next one, which is tied to actually communicating with us and being in small mentorship groups is becoming a professional coach. So that one's communication, content creation, marketing, uh, business development or budgeting, because different coaches are going to be employees versus contractors versus personal trainers versus entrepreneurs. And I don't think there's a lot of good information in terms of how people should think about that if they're getting into the industry. So those five are basically what we're considering like our level one or our certification. We don't know exactly how all of that's going to be delivered, except that this first course is part of that. And then on the website, there'll be more information about kind of what the direction of all of those things is going to be. Yeah. And in terms of timeline, it, we this now one took us four months, almost four, five. Yeah. Almost five. So you can kind of expect that we'll repeat that five yeah. months over and over and over. Right. You'll continue to work on the next one and then yeah. put that out and then yep. the next one. Uh, and when does the coaching movement course come out? It should be out when this comes out, right? Yeah. January six, Monday, January oh, 16th. Snap. <laughs> oh yeah. Just making sure. What a quinky dink. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if that, if the sales page has the quote or not. <laughs> yeah. What right. was the quote? It was something about, uh, y'all have good intentions, oh, but yeah. no systems. Yeah. Look at It was at one Oh one Oh seven. Yeah, you, you oh, did you look at it? Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> you, you put it in. He before, said, "I you got to remind me." So I looked. Before y'all all rush off to the sales page to purchase or to see if the quotes there, uh, let's talk about two weeks ago. We had a, a little conversation about Gatorade Cherry. Oh God! Wow, we did. I think yeah. the people came out. And I said, could not believe. Spoken. I know. Although I had to, I had to admit this to Chris. So I had a. 24 pack which meant eight of them were the white ones and that first white one that i brought in here was the first of eight because i had gone through all the 16 good right. flavors got to this and i was like oh just drinking it reluctantly and then after the eighth one there must be like there's <laughs> heroin in it or something because now it's called the, 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 yeah. The, yeah. fentanyl no no, <laughs> no you'd be dead yeah but by the time i got to it and he had told me all those comments. I was like, oh, I don't know. I might agree with them. Wow, so like you it. like it? I like it now. I, it's poison. I, no. It must it's be disgusting. It must be it's poison. so gross. Do you like the white kind? No. Yeah. I, I like original, not the zero yeah, yeah. shit. The original. Well, orange. the original is definitely better. Yeah. yeah. I do. Does the original on, have a white, a white cherry? No. No. There's some kind of, Maybe. it's a glacier something. Yeah, glacier yeah. freeze, I think. No, is that I like, what it is? I'm, I'm old school. I like the original orange, the original red, and the original yellow. Dude, yeah. you remember how Gatorade used to taste like in the 90s? Yes. Like there was like a different vibe going. What what did they change? I'm not sure. Probably every day. <laughs> every, <laughs> probably you every like, probably less sugar now. As like a kid. Oh, dude, no. Those were, that's because they mixed them. If you No, I'm talking about if even you bought them and they were in glass bottles. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. They just tasted different. Someone leave a comment if you know what, what yeah. changed in Gatorade. Also, for those of you that left a comment that were comparing this to normal Gatorade, get out of here with that. <laughs> of course, normal Gatorade is yeah. better. <laughs> if I try to drink three of these a day of normal Gatorade, you know what I don't I'd think have diabetes. Though, is, um, diabetes. Like, <laughs> at this point, I think I like Coke Zero better than a Coke. I haven't had a regular Coke in a couple of years now, but yeah, it's I think I'd rather a Coke Zero. It's just, it, they got the proportions right. I, it's not too sweet. Heroin in it. <laughs> <laughs> <The caffeine. laughs> I don't think I've had a regular Coke in over a decade. What? 
I, I also don't have same. Coke Zero oh, or Diet okay. Coke either. I mean, I've had some if we, like Jordan will get a Diet Coke and I'll have a sip of it to see if it's good. And I just think it's disgusting. Diet really? Coke's wax yeah. sauce. I don't even know why they keep making that. <laughs> uh, same. I haven't had any non-Zevia soft drink in as long as I can remember. Really? It's literally been maybe more than a decade yeah. at this point. Really? I just don't even enjoy it. I don't like it. Yeah. I mm. had I have had a Sprite. I haven't even had. Do that. you like Sprite? Because you really. said that you're a big, Le- LeBron LeBron James fan. <laughs> big, Le- big LeBron fan. That's why you drink it. <laughs> yes, I love LeBron. Is LeBron a Sprite guy? Yeah, it, it, that was Sprite, his first deal. Is Sprite owned Sprite. by Coke? Uh, no, or was it a different uh, company? I don't know. Or Pepsi? I know Seven Up and Dr Pepper are one company based out of Dallas, and it's, oh. and they kind of get distributed to Coke and Pepsi equally, depending on where you're at. I feel like every podcast we should have a uh, something that we disagree on. Like a food flavor movie or something, and all right. Pull so, the what, what about this week? What do we disagree on? What's what's the go to breakfast meal? Mm. I eat the same thing every single day. So every day. Well, the go to yes. breakfast meal or the go to what I wish my go to was right, because yeah. I don't <laughs> care about being huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's do yeah. let's do that one. I would want a bacon egg and cheese sandwich on a croissant. It would be that's, every that's day. What I eat. No waffle, every day. no cereal. Every day on no, a croissant. I was like, holy <laughs> shit. He, he could though. I know. We went to co- we we went to Granite <laughs> Games together. This guy, like I, I get it. Is that the competition every night though? It was a giant bowl of cereal. You had like I don't <laughs> yeah. even remember what you were eating. With probably it. probably frosted mini wheats. Yeah, he's that guy. One it's, of my you and all those swimmers, dude. Y'all yeah. can just do whatever the fuck you want for the rest of your life because you swam <laughs> twice in high school. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of my favorite quotes of Kyle of all time. We were talking about holidays, and he was talking about cookies being piled up, and he was saying. A lot of times I'll eat extra cookies to save people in my family from over consuming. (laughs) What a guy. (laughs) I was like, I'll take it. (laughs) The thing that's really sad though, is that I'm pretty sure from, from a physiological perspective, it doesn't seem to affect me at all. And I know that it would affect Oh, I would my, definitely get that. He was out there yeah, doing my parents parents work, Max. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I want that job. <laughs> I, want, I gotta go to parties and overeat for people eating donuts. Like I'm doing this for you. Guys. I don't want my parents getting type two diabetes. Oh, <laughs> I feel okay. you. That's Anyways. a good place to end it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Movement and donuts. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye.